Let's pray. God, I pray now as we open up your word, I pray that you would speak what is true. And so I pray that you would change whatever words come out of my mouth so that your people that you dearly love would hear exactly what they want to hear. For those gathered here and for those online, Lord, speak so we hear you and experience you and see you, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, this summer is certainly different than any of us would have anticipated when we started this year. And I know a lot of you have had vacation plans that have just completely been derailed and changed. And for a lot of our students who were looking forward to going to Camp Eagle this year, uh, that is not happening this year. And my heart aches for our students who are missing out on camp because I, I love Camp. I love what goes on in camp. I led, I know it's hard to believe, but back when I was young um, and a lot cooler, I led a lot of camps. And here is uh, one of the camps that I led. I think there were 13 years uh, in a row that I was leading summer camps where we'd just go find a community that needed help and we would come and re repair houses and we'd share Jesus with people. Um, but to see the transformation that would happen in the students' lives that would go on these trips, it was amazing to see, which is why. I dedicated so much time to leading a group of people to go out and do that. I love that because it is just transformational. When you take yourself out of an environment and you put yourself into a different environment, it just gives God a lot of room to do a lot of great work. And I think that's what God has been doing now in these last several weeks with COVID-19 when a lot has changed for a lot of people that this gives us a great opportunity to see some different things in our lives. So I want to brag a little bit, if I can, on our youth ministry here. Um, as I mentioned, Camp Eagle is not happening this year, and a lot of you know we do a pumpkin patch, and the proceeds to that pumpkin patch go to the students so they can offset the cost to go to Camp Eagle, and they raised a lot of money uh, this last year. It was the best year they've had in the pumpkin patch, and, and so they had sent that money to Camp Eagle, and Camp Eagle said, well, we're not doing camp this year. You can do one of three things with the money. Um, you can either um, get a refund for that money, and we'll send you the money back. You could leave it um, in our our bank account and just keep it there for next year and that'll be there for you um, or if you want you can donate that money and I tell you I'm really proud of our students because what they chose to do was to donate that money the vast majority of them said you know rather than keeping that for ourselves um, we'll most likely have another pumpkin patch this fall God will provide and we'll be generous and, and so between that and a few other families who went above and beyond, uh, we had given Camp Eagle um, a donation for $8,500 because <laughs> they're not having camp this year, so they have no income and they still have expenses. And, and I love the fact that part of the story here at St. John is our youth and their families were generous to a ministry that has meant so many to so many families. And I love that. Because in a, in a world that seems to be all about hoarding and keeping it to ourselves, um, here is the reverse of that. Because that really is often what happens when you follow Jesus. He turns things upside down. What the world is doing, Jesus is telling us to do just the opposite. And instead of hoarding, um, our youth ministry, um, as Corey was leading through that process, decided, no, let's be generous. That's the opposite of hoarding. So we're going to do just that. And I love that. It made me stop and wonder. I thought, man, when I was their age, um, I wonder if I would have thought like that, that my first reaction would have been, hey, why don't we be generous? Because I'll be honest, I think my first reaction would have been, hey, let's keep that because then I can think I can go for camp for free next year. Between this money and money next year, I think we'll be covered. And they said no. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure what I would have been as a kid because this was me at camp, by the way. I'm not sure I picked up on a lot of stuff at camp. That was our uh, between eighth grade, ninth grade camp. And, uh, and so there I was slung out on a log. I probably missed a lot of things going through life. But whether you've ever been to a camp, my guess is if you follow Jesus for any period of time, You've had some kind of experience that was like, I want to capture this in a bottle. Man, I want to keep this forever. This has transformed my life. And you just crave those moments, whether it was camp or maybe a worship experience or somewhere you were at, you just connected with Jesus on such a deep, deep level. But if you've ever done that, you know what happens next. What happens next is 
that goes away. And you're like, oh, I promise, man, my life is gonna be forever change. And then a couple days later, you're right back into the same muck you were before. And you're like, man, what happened? I had this great, I meant to really follow Jesus more with my whole heart, but I'm, I'm back to where I started before. And in that moment, you can do a number of things. You can go back and keep searching for that next spiritual fix. And you can look for the next high spiritually. And you can run from church to church to camp to camp. And you're just constantly chasing after an experience. And that never leads and ends well. Or the other thing that some people do is they just give up on God altogether. They're like, well, I guess God isn't real because I had this great experience and then it's gone away. So I guess God is not really there. And a lot of people give up on God. But I think even equally as sad as those first two are, it, are some people it just turn the page. <laughs> and it's like, well, that was just a chapter in my life and it really didn't mean much at all. Let's just turn the page and go on to the next chapter in my life. And I think that's really sad. There, there are a lot of songs that have been written about turning the page, by the way. One of my personal favorites, being a Detroit native, is Bob Seger's um, Turn the Page. <laughs> a lot of songs have come out after that song a, as well. And just even the lyrics of that, and I was listening to it again just a few weeks ago when I was putting this message together and thinking through that as he's, you know, on the road and going from city to city, and it's like, gosh, the same old, same old. You get up on the stage, and you bleed your heart out. You go out to eat afterward, and you eat at a restaurant, and people are like, oh, who are you? Are you a man? Are you a girl? I don't know what you're up. And he said, you have the same conversations over and over, and then you just turn the page, and you're right back into the next thing again. And I wondered, I'm like, how many people feel that same trap that it's just, man, I'm just keep turning pages. That's all I'm really doing with life. Or maybe you find yourself today and you're like, I'd just like to turn the page, but the reason I want to turn the page is I want to forget what's on the page before that. And the problem with turning the page is there's another nuance to this. And look at this definition of turning the page. To move on to new involvements or activities to make a fresh start. And that's what a lot of us want to do when we turn the page. We just want to have a fresh start. And there's nothing wrong with wanting a fresh start. Um, God says, you know, my mercies, my mercies are new every single morning. That is a fresh start. But the problem with this is we can turn the page, but it's still part of our story. You can go to a new school, but your old school is still part of your story. You can change jobs, but your old job is still a part of your story. Some people will turn the page and get a new spouse thinking that that's going to solve everything, but it's still, the old one is still part of your story. Which leads us to a couple interesting questions. Now, if you were here last week, I promised I would get you one question that will really help you live your life better, and we're going to get to that. But before we get to that, i got a couple of questions that are going to help us get to that one question. And so the first question is simply this, what do I do with the part of my story that I don't want anyone to know. We all have parts of that story. I have parts of that story. I don't want anybody to know. You have parts of that story. You don't want anybody to know. What are you supposed to do with those parts of the story that you don't want anybody to know? It's part of your story. You can turn the page, um, but it's still there. It's still part of your story. Well, Paul who some of you are familiar with. Paul wrote a number of the books that make up what we call the New Testament. And, and Paul started his career as a zealot. He was extremely zealous for following God. And in the midst of that, decided this new movement of Jesus followers had to be squashed. And so he did everything he could to destroy the movement of Jesus' followers, including persecuting people, imprisoning people, putting people to death. In fact, he was there when Stephen, the first martyr we hear about in the book of Acts, was stoned to death. It was Paul, whose name at that time was Saul, who was standing there at the highest ranking official giving approval that he should die. So if anybody know what it feels like to, like, I'd just love to forget about the past. I'd love to start new and fresh again and just turn the page. It was Saul. But God got a hold of his life. And, and listen what he says in Philippians. Here's some great advice if you want to know about what to do with things in your past that you wish weren't there. Brothers and sisters, because this isn't a men thing. <laughs> it's not a woman thing. It's an every human creature thing. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. In other words, my story's not done yet. But one thing I do, 
forgetting what is behind. And I thought that is a really interesting phrase, forgetting. And, and so I thought, well, you can't really forget because isn't it true? Maybe it's just true of me. My, my deepest regrets are the ones that are foremost sometimes in my mind. That I, those are the things I can't forget. I, I forget phone numbers, anniversaries, names. I forget all the things I want to remember, but the things I want to forget are the things that are just stuck and implanted in my mind. So what does it really mean to forget? Well, it doesn't mean that you don't remember it anymore. What it literally just means is I'm not going to give that any weight anymore. In other words, I'm not going to take something that happened in the past and let that dictate my direction for the future. That's what it means to forget. And this is what Paul said. I'm not pretending my past didn't happen. I'm not pretending those things didn't exist. I'm not making excuses for those things. I'm just not going to bring those into my today because I'm heading in a different direction today. I've got a different trajectory for my life today. That's what it means to forget. So forgetting what is behind and I'm straining toward what is ahead There's still more chapters, there's more pages to be turned, more things to write. For what are you doing, Paul? I'm pressing on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He knows how the book ends. When you turn the last page, he knows it's heavenward. That's where I'm spending eternity. Yesterday I got a Facebook message post from uh, a friend of mine, actually the wife of a friend of mine. He said, hey, John, I just wanted you to know that um, Bill's mom passed away yesterday. And uh, my heart aches because I, I loved her. She's a sweet, sweet woman. So I, I <clears throat> you know, messaged her right back. I'm like, does he still have the same cell phone number? Here's the number I've got. She's like, oh, no, no, he got a new work one, so here's his number. And so I, I called him right away and, and chatted with him. I'm like, oh, I'm so, so sorry. What, what happened? And, and he had said, he said, well, several months ago, we had to put her in assisted living. She was falling and just not able to keep up with herself. And, and she was doing fairly well. And uh, she was anticipating the birth of our baby, uh, her first and only grandchild. And she was really looking forward to that. And, uh, and then COVID-19 happened, and uh, she wasn't able to see the baby um, in her assisted living place. And so I brought her uh, a book, and so she saw pictures, you know, kind of thing. And she was just so proud and had this... <clears throat> but then she got sick. She had kidney failure, and she had, had congestive heart failure, and, and then she'd gone into the hospital, and they said, there's really nothing we can do um, anymore for her. We just suggest hospice. And he said, the beautiful thing is it enabled me to be able to spend a few last days with her. And so she went pretty quickly um, after that diagnosis, and he said, I was sitting in a room, and the last couple days, she just mumbled. If you ever been around somebody at the end of their life, sometimes they don't really make any sense. They're just mumbling um, uh, incoherent words. And he said, this is what she was doing and he said so she's mumbling and I'm just talking to her and praying for her and encouraging her I love you mom and and in the middle of those incoherent words she said heaven he said as clear as day heaven (laughs) and then went back to mumbling again and he said it was John it was such a peaceful moment in in this thing I can't even begin to describe it and I said Bill isn't that a wonderful gift that God gave to you in the clarity of the moment like your mom was about ready to turn the last page And she knew what the last page was. It was heaven. (laughs) And she was just declaring what was written on the last page. This is it. My book has been written now. I'm getting ready to close the book. Heaven. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? Like, you know where she's at. And and so we cried and prayed and just, you know, tried to encourage him as best I I could. And I thought, that's true of every one of us. We're turning the page uh, until we come to the last page. And so what a beautiful thing we can do. But here's another question that we want to ask before we get into our our final question. How can I live my life without wanting to turn the page? Because there's a way that we turn the page just so we can hide the the stuff on the back. Wouldn't it be better if we could stop ourselves before we made a bad decision? (laughs) That would be a much better route to go. As I reminded one kindergarten kid, um, knew this teacher and came up to the teacher and said, um, Teacher, I, I want you to know I'm about ready to make a bad decision. <laughs> like it was a premeditated bad decision. He just wanted her to know in advance. I thought through it. I thought through the consequences. I'm going to make a bad. Wouldn't it be great like in that moment to be able to stop yourself and go, I want to think about this. And so how do you do that? Well, this is where the story that Steve read a moment ago comes from. And I did want to give you just a little backdrop to that story. Because the story is of King Saul. He was the the first king of Israel, and he was the only king, the first king. 
And so he was there, but his heart began to turn away from God, and God saw that, and God said, I'm going to raise up another king, and I want you to go anoint a king. And so he sent Samuel to anoint King David as a young boy, and so he was going to be anointed, he was anointed as the next king of Israel. Well, David um, became part of Saul's court, and he ate with the, uh, the family, and he was a part of the family, and did all of those kind of things together, and, and David then killed Goliath, and so that ensued, and it, David's popularity was rising, and people are like, hey, Saul, you're okay, but boy, David is... And so Saul began to get really jealous of David. And so eventually that frustration um, and anger and jealousy turned into venomous hate and he wanted to murder him. And so David takes off and he gets a few mighty men that he could trust around him and he goes into the desert of Israel, into the En Gedi. And he's hiding in the rocks in the mountains and I remember when we were there in Israel, just the end of January, with a number of people from church, I remember being out in the En Gedi Desert and looking it up in the hills and the mountains and going, I wonder which one David was hiding in. <laughs> I wonder where this story comes from. And so Saul goes out with 3,000 soldiers, not really a fair fight. <laughs> And he's like, we're going to find him. 3,000, we're going to go and look at every cave. We're going to find this guy. And so they're plowing through the desert looking for David and looking for any sign of life from him. And as you can't make this stuff up as fate would have it. All of a sudden, he has to go to the bathroom. And if you're just a soldier in Saul's army, it didn't really matter what you needed to do. It mattered what the king needed to do. And when the king had to go to the bathroom, everything stopped and the procession stopped. He gets off and like, where am I going to go to the bathroom? I want some privacy. He goes into one of the caves and not just one of the caves. He goes into the cave where David and his men were hiding. And he comes out of that bright desert sun and he goes into a cave, can't see a thing, and goes in a few steps to relieve himself and go to the bathroom. And while he's in there, um, the men see what's going on because their eyes are darkened with the cave and they see Saul coming into the cave and the men are whispering to David, you're not going to believe, like Saul's here, like this, this must be from God. God delivered your enemy into your hand. Go take him, David. The kingdom is yours. This has got to be what God foretold and wants you to do. And so David begins to to take steps toward Saul and something happened in those moments where he started out with the intent that this is mine and I'm going to kill him and something changed and instead of killing him he just took his sword and cut off a piece of his robe and so what happened in that moment well, we don't know but Andy Stanley gave me this question, gosh, probably 15 years ago I first heard him say this, and I love this question. I wish I would have known this question. I was in middle school and high school and college and early in adulthood. I, I wish I would have known this question. This is what I want to pass on to you, which I promised to give you from last week. One of these questions that will help you from making bad choices and living with a whole bunch of regrets. And so here it is. What story do I want to tell? What story do I want to tell? I imagine that something stopped David in that moment and goes, is this really how I want to become king? I can just imagine sitting around with my grandkids and great grandkids, hey, Grandpa David, would you mind telling us again how you became king over Israel? Oh, it's a great story, kids. Here, sit down. Let me tell you. We were uh, in a cave because the king wanted to kill me. And so I was hiding in a cave, fearing for my life. And, and there I was with a few of my men. And then King Saul just happened to come in. He had to go to the bathroom. And so he came into the bathroom, and, and he was doing his business. And, and then I just came up with a sword and cut off his head. And I came out of the cave with his head in my hand. And I said, oh, wow, you must be king now. David, you're king. And that's how I became king. <laughs> and I imagine something in his mind is like, I don't want that to be my story. I don't want that to be the story that I killed the king. That's why I love this question. If you can pause before you make a decision and ask, what story do I want to tell? Because it's going to be a part of your story. <laughs> it's a permanent part of your story. And so you can pretend it doesn't exist, but it's, it's still there. And so to stop and ask, what, what story do I want to tell? So I can look back over my life and sit down with my kids, my grandkids, friends, whoever else you want to sit down and share your story with, that I don't have a whole pile full of regrets. So what kind of story do you want to tell? Well, there's a few nuances of this that I'll, I'll share with you. One, you don't want to share a perfect story. One, because nobody has a perfect story. And, and so often, this is what we do in church, right? We clean up our story and make it as perfect as possible. It's like, oh, wow, you're wonderful. And don't you hear those stories and you walk away going, wow, I'm not that person. 
My, my daughter, I think, is, has taught me this really well as, as a dad. I think what my daughter relates to most often when we're driving home and I'd pick her up from school and we have these little conversations, she'd connect more with me when I would tell her stories of where I failed than when I succeeded. Because there's something about, wow, you failed too, dad, <laughs> that gives you permission to connect because when you're just perfect, nobody can relate to perfect because none of us are perfect. And when you share your perfect story with somebody, nobody relates to that. And this is why David, and this is why it's forever written in the story of Samuel. Look at verse five. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. Well, how do we know that? Because David told that story. He could have just ignored that. Nobody had to know I cut off a piece of his robe. No, that's part of my story. I did it. I'm ashamed of it because I disrespected the king. I dishonored the king. And now that's forever part of my story. And I regret that. So we're not sharing a perfect story. We're not sharing an abridged story. Nobody wants to share an abridged story. That hold on, let me, let me clean up this. Some, you know, your kids go to find an old high school yearbook and you're like, oh, no, no, let me pull that one back. Let me see what's written in there and let me clean this up a little bit. I don't want you really discovering everything that went on when I was your age. And so you go through those moments. It's a bridge. Or I'm just gonna cut out some pieces of my history so that you don't know about it. Nobody wants to have to tell an abridged story. And I, I thought of why is it that we like to tell abridged stories? Most of the time because we're ashamed, we regret. And, and if you have shame and regret this morning, just know that has already been paid for and forgiven. There's this old phrase in the church called the cross is enough. And what that means is everything that you've ever done or ever could dream of doing or ever will do in your life, it's already been paid for. The cross paid for everything. There's not a sin that you could think about committing that Jesus didn't die for, that hasn't already been paid for. The cross is enough. And God is in the redemption business, if you didn't know this, that God loves to take a hold of a life that is in the wrong direction, full of darkness and hatred and bitterness and anger and regret and mistakes and take that life and do something extraordinary through that. This is what our God does. This is what he did with Paul, the one I mentioned earlier, who went out killing followers of Jesus and became the, one of the biggest proponents of sharing the name of Jesus. Nobody wants an abridged one. And you know what's a good reminder? And I was reminded of this as I was reading this through that God loves it when people look at themselves and go, I don't like this part of my life. I want this to change. I want to repent of this. I want to turn. I don't want this to be part of my story anymore. It's been a part of my past, but I don't want it to be a part of my future anymore. And you know what goes on in heaven? There's a party going on in heaven in that moment. Luke records it this way. Look at Luke chapter 15. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. God is more happy if one person this morning watching online or sitting right here would come to their senses and go, I don't like the way I'm living here. I don't think this is not leading me toward life. This is darkness. This is leading me in a wrong direction. I want to change this area. There is more celebration in heaven over that happening than 99 people going, isn't God great? Isn't he wonderful? Yes, he is. <laughs> but God wants to see lives transformed. Don't, don't tell an abridged story. Don't tell a perfect story. Tell an honest story. That's one we all want to tell. An honest one. Because there's something beautiful about that that, yeah, I made some mistakes in my past. I can be honest with that. I can share that with you. There's healing in that. We shine light in the, yeah, that was me. I made some really poor decisions. But boy, here I am today. God has transformed me because that is a story that people resonate with and love to hear. This was Paul's story too, by the way. He shared this with Timothy. Near the end of Paul's life, he had mentored Timothy, this young pastor, and put him in charge of a church and he had been mentoring and encouraging him. And near the end of his life, he said this, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. I'm not one of many sinners. I'm the worst. Paul's like, I can't think of anybody who could do anything worse than what I did. <laughs> I'm the worst of them. 
And this is why Christ Jesus came into the world to save me. Some of you need that today. Jesus came into the world to save you. He loves you. He cares about you. He died for you. He rose for you. This is why he came. So we can turn the page and begin to write a different part of the story. We can begin to leave a legacy. So let me leave you with a couple of questions here today. And I hope um, these are not just quickly fill in the blank. I hope these are ones that you just take some time to meditate on, pray about, ask God about, wrestle with, and spend some time this week with these questions. Number one is this. What one thing would I like to change? There's one thing I, I love about COVID-19 is it, it has changed enough for us where it's taken us out of our normal environment and placed us in a new one and, and it's exposed some things that we'd love to see change. I, I don't want you to pick 10 things. Don't be an overachiever. Pick one. <laughs> Just one. Because you pick 10, you're not gonna do any of them. Pick one and there might be a chance that God is gonna transform your heart because it'll have your mind and have your focus and your attention. Pick one. Here's one thing. I don't need to change your whole life today. Just one thing. God, what's one thing you want me to change that could help me to live in freedom and to live in peace and I could turn the page with, with joy and, and, and gladness and appreciation for all you've done for me, God? What's one thing you want me to change? And then with that, the next question, what is one thing I'm willing to do to see it happen? Because one thing to just write it on a page or if you're bold enough, you could put it down in the little notes on the bottom of YouTube or Facebook if you're watching online. Here's one thing I'd love to see change and encourage one another that way. But let me encourage you to find somebody to share it with, whether you put it in the chat section online or you share it with a friend. You can call them up and say, you know what I was thinking? <laughs> After this message I heard on Sunday, here's one thing I'd like to see change. Would you help me to keep this in my mind and on my focus? And would you help hold me accountable and talk to me every week, just ask me how it's going? Because I really want to see this change in my life. I want to write a new story. I want to turn the page. So let me encourage you this morning to do just that. Turn, turn the page. There's more of your life yet to be written. There's a legacy to leave. And the world needs people who have an honest story. That Jesus called me out of this way of living into a better way of living. And Jesus set me free from this, and, and now I'm free. But the world needs more of that today. Would you be one of those persons who leaves and lives a legacy?